Welcome everyone um, to Udacity Festival 2018. This is our final session for today, so we are thrilled to have you all here. My name is Jane Shepard. I am the Director of Growth and Strategy for Careers here at Udacity, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you all to the first ever Udacity Festival 2018. So thanks for joining us. Um, we have an excellent session here for you to kick off, to end our day with. Uh, I, I feel like we saved a, a really good one for the end here. So thanks for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about how to pitch your project to get the job. And we have invited two experts on that subject, two alumni, Suhasini Gadam and Matt Lubbers, to talk about how they did exactly that. So let's jump in here to the next slide. Before we get started, um, you know who we are. We'd like to know a little bit about who you are. So if you can type into the chat where you're joining us from, we'd love to hear where everyone is from. I see Nashville, Tennessee, New Orleans, New Jersey, Nigeria, Canada, Egypt, France, Colorado, Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Hi, Becca. Luxembourg, Berlin, um, Johnson City, San Francisco, Michigan, uh, Sunnyvale, California, Wisconsin, San Francisco, Nigeria, Portland, Pensacola, Oh my goodness, Cape Town, Beacon, New York, uh, Utah, El Salvador, Greece. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here. Bogota, Colombia. Oh my goodness. Aurora, Illinois, Pittsburgh. Thank you, everyone. It's amazing to have you all. So welcome, welcome. Um, we're glad to have all of you here. So let's dive in and get started. Let's start with what we're going to do today and what this day will look like. Um, I'm going to introduce our two experts who will be talking to you today, and then we will go through three major principles. Um, so before I do that, let me introduce our experts. So we'll start with Suhasini Gadam. Suhasini is uh, an alum, a Udessi alum, and she has some great advice for you on how she pitched her project to get her job. Suhasini, would you like to say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Suhasini. Um, I'm the product uh, marketing manager at Movie Mentor, which is now um, active, and we build self-driving cars um, and mobility solutions. And I am a graduate from the digital marketing nano degree, and I'm currently doing the data analytics nano degree, and I'm enjoying myself. Awesome! So a dual, a dual degree. Wonderful. Um, and next we have with us Matt Lovers, who is also a multi nano degree graduate. So Matt, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Matt Lovers. I'm Director of Systems Engineering and Operations at Voyage. We're also building a self-driving car. Um, previously worked in the automotive industry in Detroit, Germany, and at an LA, uh, LA startup. Um, and I enjoy beach volleyball and also I'm a professional test driver. I'm currently studying in the robotics uh, nano degree. I've finished my first term and I'm also doing the self-driving car uh, nano degree and I've completed the uh, data analyst nano degree. So we almost have every school of Udacity covered between the two of you, so thank you both. Um, so let's dive in. Um, so today we're going to go through, um, next slide please. So I think we'll, uh, okay, so we'll just dive into the first principle then. So the first principle that we're going to talk about today in how to pitch your project is to be professional and to know your audience. Um, being professional can take on many connotations and knowing your audience might influence what professional looks like in that vein. So part of making your pitch is having the confidence to actually speak up, knowing who to connect with, knowing how to connect. So I'd love to start with Suhasini first to talk about how you were able to summon your confidence to make your pitch and how you got your job. Sure, um, I've done interviews, um, a lot of interviews with different companies, especially in the Silicon Valley. Um, I think the employers who want to know what kind of projects you worked on um, they're looking at your achievements, how you've been successful, um, what are the processes you use. It doesn't matter um, if you failed on things or if you made mistakes. Um, I think what people do care about is how you overcame those challenges and what you learned from them. And that would be the best way um, to really pitch your project. Awesome. Matt, how about you? How did you pitch your project and tell us you have a really interesting story about how you pitched your project to get the role, your role at Voyage. Would you like to share that with our audience? Uh, that's very true. So I can absolutely say that uh, I got my job because of Udacity. So I went to the Udacity Intersect uh, in back in March 
I met uh, my current CEO, Oliver Cameron there. He was a panelist uh, as well as I got to meet him afterwards um, and talk to him a little bit about self-driving cars. So I'm sure that everyone asked, you know, what do you talk to a CEO about? Uh, but really my biggest advice is to ask them, you know, what it is that the company does, what it is that uh, they believe that the customer wants, where's the demand, and uh, then kind of use that to understand what the what the gap is between what they need and what you can offer with some of the projects and skills that you've acquired. That's awesome. What you're really talking about there also is making that human connection. So no matter who you're talking to, it's a person, right? So connecting with them on a human level means that you need to connect by listening first so that you're talking to them about things that matter to them. And I know, Matt, you did this in your conversations with Oliver. Can you give a little more details about how you first made the connection and elicited what his goals and what his importance was so that you could then pitch your projects and your portfolio work in the vein of what he was interested in hearing about? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, when I talked to Oliver, he was really passionate about both the, the customers that we were able to serve through these small communities in uh, the retirement communities in Florida through self-driving cars. But I listened to what he had to say and he said, you know, we know it's a very difficult problem. You know, Waymo and Mercedes are trying to solve this big problem anywhere in the world. And we're looking at this isolated community. I was able to use that and really say, okay, well, what's your target demographic? What's their age? Where are they going to? And I used that to be able to tie in some of my data analyst uh, nano degree projects very similar to the bicycle uh, project, if you guys uh, are familiar on, online. But I use that to be able to say, okay, how can we characterize the flow? How do we need cars do we need? Uh, what are some logistic problems that we can solve? And I have that type of experience now because of my project with Udacity. Uh, and that really helped him understand, hey, this is a, it's a candidate that knows uh, where to start and hit the ground running. So it sounds like sometimes asking the right questions shows your knowledge even more than answering questions, right? By knowing right. to ask the questions to elicit what the information is. That's awesome. Um, Suhasini, I was interested in your approach to this because your story is also interesting. Sometimes knowing your audience doesn't mean looking in a new company. You might be able to look within your own company. So can you share with us how you were able to leverage your projects with your current role to help ease that transition into a new job? Sure. Um, so we are a startup company and what we wanted to do was we wanted to build brand presence. Um, and doing Udacity's projects helped me to really pitch a project um, with so on social media. So I came up with a bunch of social media marketing campaigns um, that really stood out from the crowd. Um, we asked the right questions like um, Jane was already talking about. Um, who is our audience? Who are these people who, who really would get value from what we are trying to build? Um, or what is the value that they're trying to gain from the things that we're talking about? So it's all about how you're building thought leadership. It's all about how you um, take, take what you're talking about to the next level. Um, and Udacity's projects really helped me to target the right people um, use um, marketing campaigns that were not expensive, um, but helped us get a good ROI. And that helped me um, be really successful in my career and really helped me to climb the ladder really fast. So That's awesome. Um, so in making these connections, um, portraying yourself in an authentic way. We talked about connecting as a, as a human being, but there's also a difference between showing what you know and coming across as being like a know-it-all, like using jargon and, and people see through that, I think, inauthentically very quickly. So how did you make sure that when you made this initial connection, right? That first connection is really tough to make where it's not just, hey, look what I made. Hey, look what I made. Look what I've done. How did you balance that so that you could make an authentic connection? Matt, you want to jump in with this one? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very common question. Um, I think it's great to point out. Uh, when I'm interviewing candidates, that's something that's very delicate. If someone comes out as uh, expressing themselves as an expert and uh, really they don't know much about my background and maybe they don't know as much as, uh, as they think they do, I think it's a good balance to understand. Uh, don't sell yourself short, um, but be able to introduce the topic. Show your excitement and your passion. Show the fact that you kind of worked through these problems um, and basically show what you have done and your results. Uh, and I think people will be appreciative. And then based on uh, the questions they ask you, you'll be able to have a good sense of what their background is as well, knowing your audience to be able to say, okay, am I gonna go technical deep with it? Am I gonna stay on the product side at the higher level and, and look at the customer interaction? I think that's really important to be able to, uh, to at least 
indicate, here's what I have done. I'm passionate about this topic. I want to learn more. I think everyone appreciates that. Awesome. So I know both of you have, um, and in one of the strengths of Udacity is that you come, you come out of the nano degree with a portfolio, but I'm curious to know when you made your pitches, did you use projects that were only part of the portfolio or did you extend that to show your individual knowledge and go beyond that? Uh, Suhasini, do you want to start first? Sure. Um, so yes, though the um, Udacity projects gave me like a head start on building my portfolio, um, I made it a point to, um, you know, do a lot more, especially I think from a marketing perspective, um, if you start writing um, on different platforms, maybe social media or maybe medium, um, where you really bring out your perspectives on different topics, um, you build opinions, you do a little bit of research and talk about uh, what you think about the industry or the market or some products, um, that really gives you a lot of leverage um, to the employers. Can they, you kind of give um, these people an idea of who you are um, and that really helps to um, you know, pave your way forward. That's awesome. So um, one of the things, Matt, how about you? Did you use um, the projects from your nano degree or did you build on that to show your, your passion and the project that you did outside of that? Yeah, it's actually both. And I think that's really powerful. So first of all, you want to be able to say, here's what I've accomplished through uh, the, the opportunities I've had at work and through my career, right? And that's very important. But also, if you can show what you've done through nano degrees and your projects there, you can kind of show uh, how much um, breadth you have of be able to have different topics. And also the fact that you've gone outside of work hours, right? You've been spending weekends and weeknights and uh, as an alum, I can tell you there's a lot of late nights you're working on your projects. I think employees understand that and they appreciate that. So showing the balance of both what you've done in your career, but also through these projects, I think they'll see that natural grit and that uh, enthusiasm that you have for the continued, learn, uh, the continued learning that Udacity provides. That's awesome. So when you're showcasing these projects, for many, many cases, um, they're technical projects. So you've built them on GitHub, right? So that's a key thing that we have advisory boards and they've said that it's really important for them to look at the GitHub and they do look. So people think that they don't look, know that they do. Employers look you up, they check to see what you've published on Medium and they check to look at your GitHub profiles to see. So it's very important to keep your GitHub organized and up to date. And I know Matt, you're very good at doing this. So if you can share your tips on how to keep your GitHub in good shape and, and ready, portfolio ready to be viewed by employers in your best light. We'd love to hear those tips. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So especially when you're looking at any type of software engineering jobs or software jobs, um, I think that's critical for employers to look at. Uh, some things that I'd recommend is number one, obviously when Udacity asks, you have two ways to submit, just try it with the GitHub. Uh, I think it's gonna have a baseline. Uh, then the other thing I like to do is number one, I like to ask my friends and my colleagues to review it, right? So I might be really in depth in that topic area, but having other eyes uh, look at it from different perspectives is really gonna help you be able to see things in a different light and also maybe how your employer, future employers will be looking at it also. And the last thing is, you know, once you've done the project and you've maybe gone the next three months, maybe you're still active and learning more in that in that space, go back and review the project in GitHub and say, hey, is there something that I could add to this? Or maybe I can explain it a little bit better and continue to make revisions on that so it's always up to date, um, especially when either uh, employers are looking for you when you're actively in a role or especially when you're actively looking. That's awesome. And what about things like contributing in not just your own projects, but like on open source? Have you done some of that where you're contributing and showing making a presence in other places? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, future employees love that kind of stuff. Um, unfortunately, I, I would say I haven't done that as much as I probably should. Uh, but uh, I know that they really do look at that and they have a high value in that. I know that uh, many of my colleagues who've been interviewing candidates have uh, definitely uh, mentioned that as well. Awesome. So Hassani, um, some digital marketers use GitHub, I know for other projects and some don't. What do you do to showcase your portfolio either on Facebook or LinkedIn or on um, what's your favorite place to showcase what you've done and where your projects are? Um, I love Medium uh, because it's, it's a new uh, platform. I don't think it's new, but um, it's catching on a lot now. A lot of people are writing um, about different things there. Um, it's becoming really popular and employers actually look to see if you're active on platforms like these. 
Um, it opens up new opportunities with um, other companies, other publishing houses, that gives you more brand visibility, right? So as a marketing person, you have your own brand. And how do you build that brand? How do you become more visible um, is a challenge. And um, if you use platforms like Medium or even social media for that matter, where you want to build networks of your own, professional networks, social networks, it really helps you to um, write about what your thoughts are, about what you want to do, what your interests are, and it really brings you closer to like-minded people. And that's what you want. That's great advice. And Kieran, if you can add into the chat channel, we actually have a video that we put on with the Chief Words Officer here at Udacity on how to get started on Medium. It's much easier than you think. So if you have not done it before, it is not an insurmountable goal. You don't have to be a published author to do this. It's really easy to get started and it's open to everyone. So check out this webinar. He gives you best practices. He tells you how to craft a story that people will want to read. So it's great advice. Um, this is also this idea of um, you know sharing your story and creating creating your narrative and getting excitement ties us into our second principle. So it's a great segue into our second principle, which is making your excitement work for you. So you created your projects because you're excited about them, right? The story is now to change, tell that to the world. So you keeping keeping what you've done to yourself is not going to help you get the story out there and share how great you are with the rest of the audience. So. Rachel, if you can switch to the next slide, we'll move on to the second um, principle, which is to make your excitement work for you. And in making your excitement work for you, what you need to do is you need to be sure that you're not just saying, I have this great idea, but how do you become other focused? How do you make what you've done appeal to other people so they're interested in what, you, what you've created? So Matt, if you can share some, some of your stories about how you created a working prototype or a story and then got other people excited about what you've done so they wanted to hear more about it. Yeah, I think naturally self-driving cars and robotics are always of interest. So I guess it depends on um, what your audience is and also what your interests are. Um, and I guess the, the key part I really think about is I try to find, uh, if I'm looking for a new position or a career pivot, I'm always looking to say, who do I know or who, do I, who can I find on LinkedIn that already has an experience and, uh, and kind of has an insight of what the job looks like day to day and how my skill set uh, might be a good fit or what specific skills I would need to brush up on. And uh, that's where I really start. And I use my projects to do that and I say, hey, is this kind of uh, what the type of work you're looking at? Because this is what I'm really interested in doing. And sometimes a yes, sometimes it's a no. And sometimes they can point me to the right area of saying, hey, maybe you should be looking at these websites. Maybe you should be looking at these forms. And that's how you can bridge the gap on between where you are and where you want to be by uh, reaching out to those uh, key people, either in industry that you do know through your alumni association or uh, finding them on LinkedIn. That's awesome advice. So Hasini, what about you? How did you, dis how did you bridge this gap? Um, I think there are two key points here. One is high energy um, and the other is a personal connection, right? So um, more than, um, you know, of course you need to be technically sound and know what you're talking about. Um, but in the end, it's, it's about how well you make a personal connection with the person interviewing you, right? Um, um, people are always looking for um, candidates that have high energy, that have positive energy, um, that are really passionate and excited about um, whatever their ideas are. It doesn't matter what the idea is, but as long as you have the energy um, about it, that really tells something about you. Um, and also, um, it's always great to tell um, a really nice story, right? Um, um, there, are, there are different ways of, you know, coming up with the story. You can build your own um, story from your personal experiences. Um, that will, something that will help build that connection. Maybe, um, you know, uh, as, you're, as and when you're talking to people, um, you find points of common interest um, and, th you know, some things that you think about. And this helps to really tell a good story and that um, supports you uh, building that personal connection. And once you do that, well, you know, literally the job is yours. That's awesome. So in getting that excitement out there, I can see a potential roadblock for some people with nerves, right? It's one thing to be excited. It's another to free yourself from 
the stress of like, how will this come across? What will they think in this, whether it's in an interview, whether it's the first time you're meeting someone. So I'm really, I'd like to take a little pivot here and dive into how you prepared yourself to make this excitement work for you. Because I think freeing yourself of some of those jitters enables you to really let your passion show through. So Matt, what were some of the strategies you used to get past maybe the jitters and the tension of what will they think about this or not being prepared? How did you prepare yourself to actually let your story shine through? Yeah, that's always tough, right? So nerves are tough and some people are better about that than others. I think the key part here is uh, knowing who you're, you're uh, going to be talking to again, knowing your audience, but also the company and also who you're interviewing with. If the company provides you the information about um, who you'll be interviewing with, kind of do some research uh, to figure out what their background is, what they might be interested in, if there's any correlation between what they're doing and also what your previous projects were. Uh, if they do not provide the, the panel prior, uh, what we could do is you could always be asking specific questions that you've prepared in advance. And you can kind of get a pretty good gauge of uh, what their experience is and also their interest. So I think that it's really about doing your homework uh, prior to the interview and that kind of helps calm your nerves, right? So kind of walk through a few different scenarios and questions that you're going to ask. Ask someone else, your friend, colleague, you know, uh, your family member to be able to help walk through that. And that helps calm you down if you already have some predefined questions and you already practiced. Suhasini, any tips for right before you make the pitch to help you just get the, the, the grit to go through it and not, not let the nerves take over and still let the excitement shine through? Um, I think it's just about um, how you give yourself a little time. Um, you know, you, once you get in the flow of doing interviews, you would probably trash the first two or three. That's <laughs> absolutely fine. You know, um, do it, but, uh, you know, learn from those interviews and move on right um don't get disappointed um we've all been there um you know sooner or later you know we're all there but um if you give yourself time and as matt said if you prepare yourself of the questions that you already know you can put them behind you right um and you are never going to know all the questions right that's never going to happen so um just think about what you want to talk about, right? It's also about how you guide the conversation um, and talk about the things that you actually want to talk about. Um, so yeah, uh, preparing for some talking points, um, talking about uh, some of your projects and what is the value that you got from your projects also helps. So yeah. do prepare yourself. I agree. One small thing to add to that that, uh, that that we talked we haven't talked about yet is it's okay to say I don't know, right? And say I don't have this experience. But the thing that I love about candidates when I interview them is I might not have this experience, but if I was to think about this on the spot, here's how I approach it, right? I think that's extremely valuable. Number one, they can say they can self-identify where they don't have the right skills. Number two, they're willing to take a challenge and uh, and be wrong. And number three, I love to see how they go through the problem and brainstorm. I think that's really important. I think uh, employers will always respect that type of answer. That's wonderful. Um, so when you talk about this, this excitement and sharing your, it's, 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 it's easy to get lost in the details of your project. So I think one thing that tied back to our previous principle is with know your audience and making your excitement work is how to present this project in the appropriate way to the appropriate audience. So you still convey the impact in your excitement, but in a way that they can digest. For example, if you're talking to the recruiter, you probably don't want to get into the really exciting nitty gritty details and nerd out on all of the things that you did to make this work at the really granular level and when you are talking to the hiring manager or your potential team members you might want to do that differently so I'm curious to know Matt how you did that across the entire arc of the interview from the initial contact with Oliver all the way through to the right. final interviews with the people you'd be working with that's a really good question and it's something I think about often every time I'm going through this interview so you're exactly right you're going through these interview levels right you'll be talking to a recruiter then you might be talking to a hiring manager or a director and then you might be talking to someone very technical all the way down to the, the very details of it so I call that levels of altitude so you have to kind of come about your project and know at what level these people are interested in and also can relate to right if you go all the way down to the lowest level of altitude you're going to sound great in your own head but uh, you're going to lose someone really quick and they're not going to understand and make the connection. Um, and so you have to kind of say, okay, what's the highest level of my project? And you need to also spend some time to understand that, right? 
uh, be able to look from above and observe and say, okay, well, how does this uh, project fit in the grand scheme of this company and what they're trying to do? And then all the way down uh, to the point where here are all the technical pieces that I have to put together. And let's talk about it in a technical manner uh, about my project with the, the technical engineer or whoever that might be. Awesome. Suhasini, anything to add about your arc of, from initial contact all the way through to landing the job? Yeah, um, I like what Matt said about the different levels of altitude. Um, when, so it, it's my personal, I'm preparing for interviews. I don't just um, read about um, what the company is doing, what the products are, who the people are who are interviewing me, right? Um, I try to read the news. Um, I try to read on the market, on the industry, um, and what is it that, um, you know, these products are bringing to the market, right? What are they bringing to their customers? Um, that helps me build stories um, and understand what the company is trying to do and, you know, what some of their challenges might be, right? Um, so it's always great to not just um, do some research on the company, but also on the market and the industry there and to kind of give you a bigger picture um, and a lot more talking points for your interviews. That is such great advice. So it's not only just talking about how exciting your project was, but why do they care about it, right? How you can translate the skills with what right. you created into solving a problem for them. And you talked about keeping up. Such a great, such a great piece of advice. So especially in tech, right? We're all in this industry where the change is happening at like lightning pace. So how do you show that you didn't just get the nano degree and then you were done and just expected like all of your work was right. done, but how do you use that as a launching pad to keep on and keep up and keep up with the changes in that? So that's excellent advice. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we talked a lot about leading with the ask and asking questions, which ties us in really well to the third principle, which is be prepared to ask and answer questions. So we talked about asking the right questions to show your knowledge and then being able to answer questions. How do you prepare, and, and Matt, you touched on saying, I don't know, if you really don't know something. What do you think is the most important thing you can do when answering questions about your project to keep it other focused and keep it relevant to the conversation without going too far inward to get lost into like the details of what you did? And how do you, how do you overcome that to keep the conversation focused proactively on the opportunity, Matt? Right, that's a good question. Um, so one thing I would give advice and kind of about that layers of altitude, it's really tricky to know how far down you should go, right? So if you start at one layer and you kind of explain it pretty well, okay, okay, now I'm gonna come, uh, come down in, in technical detail. Um, my biggest advice is come up for air, right? That's a, a good metaphor to say, just pause a second and uh, try to read your audience to say, are they following me right now? Are they engaged in this conversation? Are they nodding their head or are they kind of just uh, in a different place and they're getting lost? If they are, okay, come back up, try to regain their attention and then find a, a way to, to go back down to project details. And if they are following you and they get excited and you can see it, uh, then continue on and allow them to ask questions uh, in the project even when you're describing it and not just necessarily wait for the end. So I think the biggest thing I would say is kind of gauge your audience of uh, their attentive, attentiveness as well as uh, if they're really following along and understand what you're, what you're trying to describe. Awesome. Did either of you practice um, in front of people to get questions? Because I think we tend when we're practicing with ourselves in our own heads to ask ourselves the easy questions. And usually the questions that you'll get in an interview are the tough ones. So how did you leverage maybe this network of other people to really get to the tough questions so you were ready for those? So how yeah. do you want to start that one? Sure, um, especially if you have friends or even people from the Udacity community, it's always great to get different opinions because different people think differently and they have diff uh, you know, always have a different set of questions. Um, and the more you get, the better prepared you are, right? It also gives you a lot of confidence um, that helps you calm your nerves. Um, especially, I think the right way to answer um, question, especially the questions that you don't know, is to um, give yourself a moment to think about a question and then ask, you know, a bunch of questions. Try and understand um, where the other person is coming from to really give um, a suitable answer um, that will take you a long way. There's actually a really good TED talk about that. I think it's called Breathe, and it's it's taking a moment when, like, you don't have to just keep. Silence is not always your enemy. It's okay to take a breath, compose yourself, and then start again. So thank you. That's good advice. Um, Matt, how about you? What do you think about this? 
Yeah, I, I really like that advice, um, really about taking a breath and also asking questions to clarify and make sure you took the right assumption. It's it's uh, somewhat embarrassing if, you know, after five, 10 minutes, you start explaining something and they said, well, that really wasn't my question. It could have been solved by just asking some questions. So I love that. Um, separately, I think it's, uh, it's also important to make sure that you um, are able to uh, address the, the question and um, with prior with your friends or family, because a lot of times I can answer a lot of the technical questions because that's what I've been thinking while I'm constructing this project, right? But uh, different angles and, um, and different levels of experience with your project, a lot of times I find myself thinking, wow, I did not do a very good job of explaining why this project exists or, or what it's supposed to do. Like the very highest level problems when I'm asking people for advice or also even just ask me questions about this project, I find out that usually I get lost on that highest level of altitude. So I think it's really important to be able to see things from different levels of perspective. And that's why I totally agree with ask other people in preparation to really understand how other people see the project and how they understand it to be able to have a pretty uh, wide breadth of um, being able to explain it well. I love the altitude analogy. That's really great. I mean, it's 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 so true, right? We're we're dealing at different levels all of the time. We've got a great question here in the chat that I'd like to pose to both of you right now, um, and this will be an opportunity for you to breathe. And we're putting you on the spot a little bit, but I know you can both handle this. Um, they really would like to hear how you pitched your project in three minutes. So everyone talks about the elevator pitch and there are going to be times when you're not in an interview where you're really just going to have to pitch what you've done or pitch why you're the best candidate to show PKs based on a project in a very short time. So how did you do that? How did you craft that elevator pitch of sorts in your project pitch to say, this is what I've done in a very short time that hits all of the high points? Who'd like to start? I could start. Um, so um, the best way to do that would be to be very result oriented, right? Um, it doesn't matter what projects you did. It doesn't matter what products you created. Um, people generally look at the approach you've taken to solve a particular problem. So it helps to build a story around what your problem uh, was or what are the challenges that you thought you could maybe provide a solution for. Um, before actually talking about the solution. So give, uh, give the employers a little context about why this is a problem and why we need a solution for it. Um, and then talk about what you did and what is the value that you got out of doing that project, right? Um, if you can give numbers, um, measurable scale of you know the achievements um, really give um, a great idea about where you stand right um, it doesn't matter if the numbers are really high or really low but the fact that you're able to measure um, your successes really um, helps you and the employer as well to know where you stand right so that would be um, you know my way of uh, building the elevator pitch. Be result oriented, um, talk about why you started off with this project um, and what it means to you. That's awesome. So the motivations and you again made it personal, right? It's authentic. It's your yes. story and it's crafting your narrative and people do remember stories. Yes. Okay, Matt, your turn. Yeah, so it's a good question. I would say it really orients to me around the problem itself. And so there's, in my mind, there's two different ways to approach it. One is that they don't know it is a problem, right? And that actually happens more often than not, right? Or right. if they ha are aware of the problem and they've tried multiple different solutions and it, that none of them are working. So um, I've had many times where I think the tougher, uh, the tougher thing for me is actually selling the problem. I've had uh, a lot of work on that in the past where I continue to get better. And selling the problem is actually really important. Um, and so making sure that the the audience clearly understands uh, before you get into a solution, why you think this is necessary um, and provide extinct, uh, ex explicit examples of that that they can relate to and understand. In terms of when they know there is a problem, um, I think you really want to be able to um, have those results oriented, uh, like was mentioned. Um, and I can tell you from my experience with Oliver, uh, basically we, I understood what the, the conversation was regarding 
what the problem was we're trying to self solve, which is self-driving cars in the community, right? Also uh, with my experience, which is, you know, in brakes and chassis controls for vehicles. And I said, okay, well, these are probably the things that you're struggling with, right? What's the speed that you want the car to go to? What happens if you have a failure with the brake systems? What do you do? Um, how do you make sure that you can have an interface with the car itself when you're adding all these complex sensors? And uh, immediately his face lights up, right? And he says, yes, those are absolutely the problems. I said, well, uh, you know, I have experience with that. And I'd love to be able to talk to you offline, right? And so you don't have to dive in all the way to the detail, just whet their appetite enough so that they're going to want to call you back. Uh, and then that's really when you get them on the line and the, and the hook. Don't tell Oliver I said that, but uh, <laughs> that's when you get them on the hook and that's when they want to call you back. Then they're going after you to say, okay, how can you really help us? And, and what do you know? And uh, this is a valuable experience that we'd love to have you on our team. That's awesome. So it sounds like timing is the right thing, right? And that goes back to your altitude question. So it's not just levels of people, it's levels of detail based on the situation. So it's situational as well as personal. Um, related to that, we have another question um, from our audience. And that's talking about, we've talked about like your passion projects and things you've done outside of the nano degree. If you haven't yet had a chance and you're just like a new grad and haven't had a chance to do projects outside of the nano degree, how can you talk about your nano degree projects to still, and you don't have industry experience, but you'd still like to stand out and show that you really are dedicated to this and, and want to stand out from the other candidates. How can you use your projects from the nano degree to show employers that you are a candidate who can grow with their company? I think, uh, again, it ties down to the research and your homework that you do before going to an interview. Um, for instance, you know, both me and Matt are in the automotive space. Um, and in automotive right now, everyone's talking about self-driving cars, right? So if you could um, somehow talk about your projects in terms of the automotive space, um, it would really make sense to the employer who's, who's interviewing you. So um, if you can somehow uh, be a little prepared about what the industry or what the vertical is that you're um, going to an interview for, um, and then try and relate your projects to some of the challenges that the industry is facing or to the, the particular company is facing that would really help um, you know, with your talking points. It's a great answer. Um, I, I totally agree with that. And I'll actually take the, the opposite side to cover that as well, which is um, not only do you need to go out on the vertical, you can also do the, the horizontal or, or the span, as we'd say, um, by saying, okay, so yes, I have a nano degree um, in self-driving cars and we talked about computer vision, right? But I'm now interviewing for medical services, right? So how can I say, all right, well, yes, my application for computer vision was on cars, but I can also use computer vision to be able to detect cancerous cells, right? Uh, so you can kind of tie in some of those projects um, for a specific application, but show how they're also general enough to be able to apply them to different areas. I think that's uh, really applicable if you can say, okay, yes, I know this, this bike sharing um, project that I did is also applicable to how we have car usage for self-driving taxis. Um, and that, that can be really powerful to say, yep, I have some experience there and I can apply it in your specific setting uh, for your company. That's awesome advice. So you're talking about like how you would apply what you've done and extend it to other things. One of the common areas about projects is that you learn from them, right? So I'm curious to know if either of you in, in, in um, if, if you've encountered this in your, in your pitching your projects, and that is if anyone asked you what you would have done differently in your project. So they, they see what you've done, you show them and you're proud of what you've done, but has anyone ever asked you the project, this is all great, but if you had it to do over again, what would you have done differently? And how do you frame that question to your best advantage? Um, I think you get that question all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Matt would agree. Uh, because um, I think some of the questions, especially if you're preparing, you know, from videos or you're preparing from books, um, the question, the answers that you usually come up with are uh, very similar to what other candidates may have may be already speaking about, right? Um, and I think Udacity's projects really help you there, right? Um, they ask you to put in um, a few lines about what you learned from the project, right? And if you focus on those points and talk about, okay, if you maybe had a bigger budget for a, you know, a new marketing campaign, what would you do? Right. And if if those are, you know, you put a lot more focus on, you know, those those that part of the project um, that will really help you. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And actually, you'd ask the projects, at least some of mine, um, they always usually ask, uh, if you were to improve the product, uh, project, what would it be uh, that right. you'd look at now? And right, that's the whole part of learning, is that you're always going to be able to take that first step. You're going to have uh, incremental knowledge, but looking back and being reflective of that is oftentimes even more powerful than the project itself. Um, and I think good employers will continue to ask that and not only from your price but also for your prior prior experience and even you know it's it's also interesting a lot of employers will ask about just life events right so not even work-related items they'll ask about life events and i think uh, being able to reflect on that and being self-critical in a good positive way to say okay if i was in this situation again what would i do differently um, i think that's a really powerful skill to practice uh, and continue to do while you're working on your projects but always be including that in the conclusion which is what would I do differently here if I had more time or if I was going to do this again from, start, from scratch? Awesome responses. So in thinking about that, what would you do differently? Um, we have a really interesting question from the audience, and that is, what if I have an idea for a project, but I don't yet have the skills to build that project? How can you leverage that idea and that, that, that sense that I have big ideas and I understand enough about this industry to have big ideas, but I don't know everything I need to build this yet, and leverage that to your advantage to get a, a help or, or a position? Yeah, uh, I have hopefully a really good answer for that. The best answer I can give you is networking, right? So if you're looking at trying to be an expert in every single area, trust me, I've tried it, it doesn't work. Uh, you have to be able to network with others who have different skill sets. Um, I think that's what's awesome about Udacity, especially with their alumni, is be able to say, okay, maybe I'm, I'm great with software, but I don't have as much experience with, with uh, machine learning or computer vision. There's classes on Udacity that have that. Connect with those people and say, hey, would you, uh, would you like to go on a joint project with me? Uh, just try this out. I have this experience. I think you can do well in, there in, uh, in computer vision. Uh, and let's try this together. Um, and so you're going to get a lot farther being able to connect with those people with those specific skills than you, than you would trying to learn everything on your own. That's great advice. And I think that most people forget that you're not being hired to sit in a room by yourself and build things all alone. You're being hired to be part of a team. So showing that you know how to work together and have collaborated with people in the past, I think is excellent advice. So Hassani, do you have any advice for someone who has an idea and maybe not yet quite the skill set to build it? Um, I would say share your ideas, right? We have social media. That's where, This is where Medium comes in very handy is write about it, right? whatever you know about it, just write about it and put it out there. And believe me, people will reach out to you um, to maybe go the next step or talk more about it. Um, and that's just how you build your network. And when you have you know, you, a team that could really work together, then go ahead and do it, right? Um, but if you don't share your ideas, then people don't know. Um, and you're missing out on a great opportunity there. So, you know, always share ideas. Um, I know a lot of people think that if, if I write about an idea and, you know, I could have patented it and it's gone, you know. Um, but um, I would say um, write, write about something like on a higher level without giving out maybe too many details if that bothers you. Um, but do share your ideas so that you can um, work with other people or people can come to you and you can make things work. That's wonderful. Um, I wish we could stay all day doing this, but we are running out of time. So I'd like to end with a question for each of you. And that is if you had one piece of advice for someone who's looking to pitch a project um, and use it to show what their skill is to either get a new job, get a get on a project with their company, break into a new role, whatever they're trying to do with it. What's your advice for leveraging something that they've done to their best advantage in advancing their careers? So Matt, let's start with you. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, number one is to, to get everything up on GitHub or something similar like Medium and then be able to have exposure, right? To be able to, to network out and say, hey, friends, family, uh, LinkedIn uh, as a whole, be able to say, here's my ideas or here's my projects, uh, help me improve, right? Everyone appreciates someone that's willing to learn and, and uh, have feedback and uh, as opposed to just saying, here's what I've done and, and this is absolutely correct. So I think my number one advice would be to, uh, to be able to uh, provide your, your current learning and your current project and ask for feedback. Excellent advice. Suhasini, what's your number one advice? Um, I think the the key point here would be to know or understand that you, if you are going to an interview, that means you're marketing yourself. Um, and that means you are a brand by yourself, right? So we need to learn how to 
market our own brand, how to build visibility. Um, and when you start, try to start building a portfolio, right? Um, if you have tangible things you could relate to, tangible things that maybe you can show your employers um, that talks volumes about you. Um, and these are all of the things that you can do before you actually go to that interview, you know, so um, you're prepared, um, you know, you it brings in a lot of confidence um, and that really helps you to drive your energy up. And that's basically all an employer is looking for. Awesome advice. Thank you both for all of the wonderful insights you've shared. I've learned a lot from the session. I hope everyone on, on the call has as well. Um, it's been wonderful. Um, I, thank you. It's, it's really been great to share these ideas with everyone. Um, so I wanted to um, close by inviting people to stay connected with us, although this is our last session of the day. The festival continues tomorrow, so you can stay connected with Udacity through the um, alumni portal if you are an alum. So it's um, alumni.udacity.com. And I know, Karen, thank you. You've put uh, the link into the chat. Um, so people can see this, but on that portal, you can find out information about your fellow alums to maybe make these connections, to work on some of these projects and find people who might have complementary skills to do what you need to do. And you can do that through looking at some of the um, organizations. And if you look at the next slide, Rachel, um, you can connect on LinkedIn, you can connect on Facebook and on Slack, and the links are all on this channel. You can also have access to upcoming events. So you can see, um, see videos, links to webinars that we've created for you to continue learning and to keep on going. If you're a current student and not yet an alum, you can stay connected with other um, students through the new student hub, which was just announced last week, um, either in your cohort in the guided study area or across your nano degree in the community area, which has just been released and is being built out even further. Um, and soon alumni will be have access to that channel as well. So we encourage you all to stay in contact with each other, um, connect with each other on LinkedIn, Stay talking to each other and join us tomorrow. Um, Karen, I don't know if you'd like to share a couple of previews on what's coming tomorrow, but we have more sessions coming tomorrow. So Karen, take it away. Sure. So tomorrow we're very excited to kick off with Matt Leonard, head of the School of AI in the global meetup for the School of AI, where you'll hear about how to break into the field as well as be able to participate in breakout sessions with other students and alums from that school. After that, we have another exciting session, a global meetup for the School of Data, and we'll be joined by Juno Lee, who's a content developer and instructor for the School of Data. And then to close that, we will have a Carla karaoke session where David Silver will be driving around in Carla, our self-driving car, uh, and explaining how self-driving cars work and how they operate. Followed by which we will have a global meetup for the School of Autonomous Systems before closing out with an event here in Silicon Valley. And thank you all so much for joining. You can find all of the events listed on udacityfestival.splashlat.com. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Hasni. Thank, thank you, Matt. And thank you to our chat moderators who've been helping to answer questions. This has been really, really wonderful. So stay audacious, keep learning, and see you all tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.